Dr. Norm Robillard received his PhD in microbiology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, studying Bacillus racis and other Bacillus species. His postdoc training at Tufts University focused on antibiotic resistance and gene transfer between the gut microbiomes Bacteroides fragilis and E. coli. Dr. Robillard is the creator of the Fast Track Diet, author of the Fast Track Digestion book series, and publisher of the Fast Track Diet mobile app. As well, his latest book series, Fast Track Digestion, has two titles, Heartburn and IBS. Let's please give a warm Seattle welcome to Dr. Robillard. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for uh, staying for the full duration of the uh, conference. Um, there's no question in my mind that lower carbohydrate diets improve the symptoms of conditions like IBS and acid reflux. How many people would agree with that? Pretty good. Could they be de doing more than helping the symptoms? How many of people agree with that? Only a couple, yeah. But symptoms are not just floating out there in space. They're being caused by something. And so the question, one question I have today is, do these diets somehow modify the disease process? Also, something I wanna get to because it's been kind of hanging out there for a while, is are these very lower carbohydrate diets, low fiber diet even, are they, are they safe for us and also for our microbiota? So that's what I'm going to talk about today. All right, when you think about these symptoms of functional GI disorders, most of them, to me, look like they're IBS related. Even heartburn and reflux, they're connected because about half of the people with IBS, IBS patients, have reflux symptoms. And half of the people with chronic acid reflux or GERD have IBS symptoms. The other thing I think about when I look at these symptoms is that underlying most of them is excessive bacterial fermentation and gas. And so today, I'm focusing on diet and IBS as kind of an example. Why diet? Okay. Here's a familiar face. I can attest to the power of diet from my own experience, not only my research over the years, but also my own chronic acid reflux that I had for almost a decade before realizing that just very low carbohydrate dieting completely controlled my reflux symptoms. And I've been like that for 15 years. So it works for me and, and, I, and I believe in diet, but um, sometimes, or oftentimes, diet is considered as, a, as an afterthought or even dismissed entirely. And this survey, I think, shows things may be changing. Right? According to Dr. Che, in this survey of 1,500 GIs, 91% felt that diet was as good or better than current medical therapies. So things are changing. There are two basic types of uh, diet that limit carbohydrates. I've broken them into two buckets here. One is I call low fermentable carb diets. So FODMAP diet, elemental specific carb diet, biphasic, SIBO specific, and my own uh, diet, fast track diet. On the other hand, there are diets that just limit carbohydrates across the board. And I call those low carb, high fat diets. So ketogenic and Atkins for sure and some versions of other diets, potentially South Beach, Mediterranean, Paleo, depending on how much they limit the carbohydrates and increase the fats. So, but I guess the take home message in the slide is, even though they're different diets, and, and one limits uh, carbohydrates that persist in the intestine and the other just limits them across the board, um, they, they all do restrict the carbohydrates entering the test intestine to some extent. And these, just to make the point better, some examples here, the fast track diet, you can have small servings of jasmine rice, sushi rice, certain potatoes that contain 
more of the easy to digest starch, amylopectin, and less of the starch amylose, which is harder to digest. Similarly, with the FODMAP diet, if foods don't contain too many of these fermentable oligo, di, monosaccharides, and polyols, you can have some of those. And the elemental diet is the best example of all because it's really a high carb diet. It, almost all of the calories are coming from dextrose, but it's absorbed very quickly in the early part of the small intestine. So I'm going to be referring to a number of these diets and making some points today. <coughs> All right, so can diets help beyond uh, symptoms? In support of, um, oh, I got ahead of myself. I can see two slides more than you. Um, so in support of Dr. Che's survey, many studies attest to um, the fact that lower carb diets help with symptoms, even limiting just individual sugars, lactose, fructose, sugar alcohols, some studies on fiber. Just these single species, limiting those help. Limiting fiber as big in Europe is just its own strategy. The elemental diet, this is a Pemintel study, highly effective at normalizing the lactulose breath test, helping with symptoms. Uh, as Dr. Che talked about yesterday, the FODMAP diet is the most widely studied of these diets, and so I just put a link in for some randomly controlled trials and an analysis of that showing that they um, really help with bloating and, and pain. Low-carb diet in general hasn't been studied that well in, in IBS, but there is a small study from the guys down at Duke. And the fast-track diet, also one of the newer diets, we are involved with uh, uh, a hospital in Chicago. Um, uh, it's called Northwest, what is it? They just changed the name, Feinberg School of Medicine. 90 patients uh, with chronic acid reflux that want to get off PPIs. So some patients have already finished that study. There's more entering, so that's ongoing. And then this, uh, what they call a dietitian service evaluation was done by some dietitians in the UK at the National Health Service led by Mike Sweeney. And there's a link to those uh, preliminary uh, findings. Okay, so can diet help beyond symptoms? To answer this question, let's break it down into three simple elements. What is IBS? What's altered in IBS? Both the microbiota and the metabolome. And then, do diets correct that? Sounds simple. <laughs> All right, what is IBS? My, my definition of IBS, I continue to kind of update it as more information is available because there's a lot of work being done. But as it is right now, I see it as a condition that involves a variety of GI symptoms caused by different forms of dysbiosis, not just one, and that result in metabolic changes in both the small and the large intestine. And so by dysbiosis, what I'm referring to is SIBO, right, which is really a lot of what this conference is about, but also LIBO. And I don't just mean dysbiosis and imbalance, I mean LIBO large intestinal bacterial overgrowth. We already have a lot of bacteria in our large intestine. Could we have more? Yes, I believe we can. And I think that's one of the things that's going on. And, uh, and also just some general uh, uh, bacterial population shifts is another, and we're gonna talk about those. And the metabolic changes we'll be looking at is pH, short chain fatty acids, and gases. All right, from a historical perspective, we actually knew quite a bit about SIBO 70 years ago. If you read this paper by A.C. Fraser, I'd hi highly recommend it. He's very focused on um, malabsorption. He wrote a book on it, and he describes SIBO to a T. Fecal bacteria getting into the small intestine and competing with the host for essential nutrients. Meanwhile, and I think Dr. Che touched on this as well, almost nothing was known about IBS. It's a paper in 1950. They labeled IBS as just a psychosomatic or a mental disorder. And it took 50 years before that gap got closed. And then it happened pretty quickly with some studies in Hunter's lab where they would build chambers, and put people in them to measure methane and hydrogen coming out of their body and from any direction. And they showed that in IBS, people had more clonic gas, and uh, that 
the, uh, and symptoms in the diet, a low residue diet really help improve those symptoms. Uh, then shortly after that, they actually culture the small intestine and put some uh, names to some of these bacteria in SIBO. And then Pemintel's group did a definitive study where they actually treated with antibiotics and show that when you knock down these bacteria, the symptoms improved and the, uh, the breath tests were better. All right, to set the stage for the next part about what's altered in the gut microbiota in IBS, um, just a little bit about us and bacteria. I mean, we've co-evolved with this diverse population of bacteria, and they do all of these great things, and everybody mentions it, you know, train the immune system, protect us from pathogens, uh, they help regulate fat storage and appetite, uh, just on and on. But the most important thing they do is they help harvest energy, and there's a survival advantage there. And that's why they need those three million genes compared to, you know, that's 150 times more genes than we do, than we have, and they need it to be able to break down this amazing variety of complex carbohydrates. And it's also why they're adaptable to diet changes. <clears throat> what I found surprising is that all of these species fit into these six or seven um, buckets or classifications, phyla. Formicutes, Bacteroidetes, Actinobacteria, Proteobacteria, and these archaea, which are they're not bacteria, they're methanogens, and Verruco microbial. And there's a few more too. Uh, there's Fusobacteria, there's fungi and protozoans. But these are the basic groups. The other thing that amazed me is that most of our bacteria in our gut, 90 to 98 percent, all of those species, they belong to either Formicutes or um, Bacteroidetes. So I'm not saying the other ones aren't important, but by the numbers, it's pretty striking. Now, when it comes to individuals, we don't have quite the rainforest that we thought we had. Um, instead of 1,000 species, when you're looking at humans as a whole, uh, 150 to 250. And, and they're being impacted. Um, Western diet, just snack and junk foods, um, cesarean births, bottle feeding. I was bottle fed. Is, is that why I, you know, ended up having acid reflux in my 30s? I don't know. But I was bottle fed. Wasn't the best, best thing you could do. Um, antibiotics is probably the worst one of the bunch. But also other chemicals, preservatives. And there is this, I guess you could call it an argument going on with me on one side and everybody else on the other side about undernutrition or overnutrition. I feel, and I'm going to make the case today, that we are overfeeding our gut microbiota. We're not starving them. There's a lot of people, most people, that feel like we're starving them. So I'm going to, all of these issues and these criticisms of low-carb diet, in the second half, we're going to just hit them head on put them out there, and just get it out there so we can work through it. Why not? All right. And this is just an example of uh, some of these uh, species that are in these different phyla. And it's hard for me to look at these and not just start talking about everyone because I love them, and each one has their own story, and it's really amazing. And then you can imagine, take that whole thousand species and put that up there into these blocks, and you can see the kind of research that we're looking at going forward. So there's a lot that's going to be happening. All right. When laboratories want to look at these microbiological changes between IBS and controls, most of the modern labs these days are using the uh, PCR-dependent 16S ribosomal RNA um, gene sequencing. And there's a reason for that, is because it's a gene, it's not an RNA, but it's the gene for 16S ribosomal RNA. And that gene has these hypervariable regions in it. So that when two strains of bacteria are more distant from each other, they're, they're going to vary in those, in those regions. So it's really a great way, it's a, it's a, a very powerful fingerprint, fingerprinting system. I mentioned culture-based here only because uh, at least one of the things I'm referencing, they did use um, culture-based testing. 
uh, but it's not used very much. The problem is most of the bacteria in our gut don't grow in culture. In a nutshell, that's, that's what the problem is. So using the gene probe strategy in PCR is really a much more powerful way to go. All right. We're going to take a quick look at the small intestine and the large intestine, and we're going to look at bacteria in the luminal space in the small intestine floating around the middle, the mucosal bacteria outside on the small intestine, and the same with the large bowel, the fecal material on the inside, and the, and the mucosal. Um, oh, yeah, and one thing I forgot to mention, you know, just some of these challenges, despite all of these challenges, population uh, variations, person-to-person -person differences is huge. Uh, there's all kinds of technique issues, not just sampling, but, you know, PCR primers and what's your library, all of this. And then when people do the studies, are they doing IBSD, uh, C, or, or mixed, and so forth, and are they, how are they teasing that apart? Okay. So... I chunked this data up. Th this, there's really about four or more slides that I prepared on this, but um, someone convinced me I might put everybody into a coma. So I'm, I put it all on one slide. Those other slides are at the end of the presentation. So if you want to look through them, they have the references, they have some more information there. And also there's a link to the studies down at the bottom here. Um, but what's striking here is that in both the small and large intestine, the mucosal bacteria are pretty stable when you look at IBS versus controls. On the other hand, in, in the lumen of the small intestine, well, that's essentially SIBO, right? It's overgrown. And so instead of having mostly things like streptococcus and other firmicutes, uh, Villanella, for instance, it's overgrown with both these gram-positive aerobic strains indigenous to the small intestine, but also um, gram-negative anaerobes from the large bowel. And that's essentially SIBO, and these are some of the phyla that those bacteria that were recovered belong to. Again, there's more detail in the slides at the end. With the fecal bacteria, the, the fecal bacteria is really um, altered, significantly altered in IBS. And the most important thing that I've gleaned, and again, you can look at those slides at the end, and all those different studies. But what I glean from this is that there's a consistent increase in the Firmicutes over the Bacteroidetes. And remember, those are the most populous groups most of our bacteria belong to. Also, they see increases in uh, this bacteria called Ruminococcus in IBSD, Ruminococcus torquez, Ruminococcus bromii in IBSC. And this is a resistant starch-loving type of bacteria, uh, these Ruminococcus, and they're Firmicutes, so they're part of that overgrowing Firmicutes. Uh, also, what comes out in these studies is increases in Methani brevibacter smithii when you look at IBSC, which is consistent with producing an excess of methane. So that all makes sense. But then there was one study I looked at, and there were a good 30 or 40 people in the study for IBSC where they found the methanogens were actually lower and the sulfate-reducing bacteria were higher. And that challenges this preliminary uh, idea that, that hydrogen sulfide, the su that the, uh, the uh, sulfide-reducing bacteria produce, that, that it causes diarrhea. Because now we see in one case at least they're overgrown and people that have constipation. So that's kind of an open question. Uh, they also see decreases in actinobacteria, right? There's your bifidobacteria and decreases in Focalibacterium, which is one specific uh, for Micutes. Okay, so at the highest level, right, small intestine, you've got this general SIBO, more gram-positive aerobes, more gram-negative um, anaerobes, and in the large bowel, you've tipped this balance. In the controls, you have more Bacteroidetes, less for Micutes. People with IBS, there's more for Micutes over Bacteroidetes. And I want to get to the next one, because every time we do this, we're going to talk about what does diet do. But before we do, I did want to um, talk about a couple of other situations where we see this. That is the same shift. Here's one study where they looked at um, uh, increasing calories in obese and lean individuals. 
and the people of the diamonds on these plots. They looked at two calorie ranges, 2,400 and 3,400, but not everybody ate everything on their plate and they measured all of that carefully. And so they ended up with this range, but it's two different ranges, a low range and a high range. But in both cases, the, the more calories people consume, the more firmicutes and the fewer bacteroidetes in both cases. We see something very similar <coughs> with uh, just looking at body mass index in the study. And you can forget about that actinobacteria graph for a minute because it's just not really relevant. It didn't change that much anyway. But you can see on the y-axis is body mass increases, so do the number of firmicutes, while the bacteroidetes go down, and so the ratio of firmicutes to bacteroidetes goes up. So that's referred to as kind of the obese microbiome model. And this, um, so in addition to those studies that I showed you, there's some other ones in humans, and there's also many studies in animals, again, showing with obesity or increased calories, you get higher from Mickey's, just kind of like with IBS. Um, but there's also some, a couple of uh, links down at the bottom here for people questioning this model. And I just wanted to put that out there as well, this questioning the obesity signature and, you know, questioning the techniques and the, and the interpersonal, um, you know, uh, how strong the studies were. So you can, you can read those as well. But when I think of IBS versus um, obesity, and by the way, not everybody with IBS gains weight, right? It doesn't mean you're obese just because if you may have a, an obese microbiota and not gain weight, especially if you have SIBO and your digestion is impacted and you're not absorbing nutrients properly. But it's interesting, if you are having a lot of malabsorption, you might be losing weight, but you might be driving a more obese microbiota because you're feed, overfeeding the bacteria and starving yourself. In these IBS studies, people tend to focus on excessive fermentation, gas, and symptoms. And in the obesity studies, they're always talking about weight gain and energy harvest. But in my mind, it looks like it's two sides of the same coin. Now, can diet correct that? I mean, and I'm, I'm calling it the healthy firmicutes back to Redidi's ratio. Um, not that that's an end-all, be-all, but that that's what you see in the healthy controls in the IBS studies, and that's what you see in lean people. And so I'm just saying re restore it to that. So I'm just calling it healthy. All right. And the, the answer is yes, you can. Now, um, and, and Megan had this issue too, with I don't always have the studies with IBS. So sometimes we have to wander off and look at something else and see if we can make some connections. And there are a lot of connections, they're not in IBS, but they're in um, healthy people, studies on healthy people, obesity studies, and also epilepsy. And so we're gonna look at those examples. With the first paper, the uh, David and Turnbaugh, and the poor authors in the middle don't get any credit, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but this was a study on healthy people, and they just tried this radical experiment. They put them on, half of the people, on just a total meat diet. Eggs, cheese, and meat. But the other group was on a plant-based diet. And what they found was that the animal-based diet increased bacteroidetes over firmicutes, now the direction we were interested in, whereas the plant-based diet did the opposite, increased firmicutes over um, bacteroidetes. Now, these were kind of radical diets, and it's just, you know, one study, and it, it was all, I don't forget how long it lasted, a week or something. So it's not the end-all, be-all, but it, it at least, my point is with the lower carbs, it seems to shift in the direction of bacteroidetes. Now, they also found an increase in sulfur-reducing bacteria and these other worries, and so we're going to talk about those in the second half. The, uh, on the end, the lay study was interesting because they were able to do the same thing, increase the bacteroidetes and reduce the firmicutes. I'm sorry. Yeah, increase the bacteroidetes and reduce the firmicutes on a low-calorie diet, and they used two kinds of diet. One was low-carb and one was low-fat. So that was really interesting. It's a little bit of a curveball that I didn't expect. But. And then 
his four more studies. The first two are in epileptic infants and another study in epileptic children, and then two uh, weight loss studies at the end. And the first one, the ketogenic diet, not only did it reduce seizures and it was helpful to the patients, but it did increase the bacteroidetes over the firmicutes ratio. The low-carb diets, both the Duncan and the Russell, and you'll see those come up for some other points I'm going to make, but in this case, they, um, it did, the lower-carb diets did increase the bacteroidetes over the firmicutes, and they may have, they may have just have as well called this, these low-carb diets keto because they, they were something like 22 grams a day of carbs or 24 grams, so they were very low-carbohydrate diets. They also had arms where they had over 300 grams, but, but on the low end, it, it did what we expected it to do. Was there another one in there? Nope. Okay. We're moving on to um, the metabolic changes. So we're going to look at pH, short-chain fatty acids, and the gases. These two studies I thought were really interesting. Um, both of these studies found pretty much the same thing. They used wireless p uh, smart pills that could measure the pH. So as they go through your stomach and your small intestine and large intestine, they can measure how, how much acidity is there. And they both found between IBS and controls, no change in the acidity in the small intestine, nothing. They were exactly the same. But in the large bowel, the farmer study looked at the cecum and found that the, the pH was a full pH unit lower in IBS compared to controls. And in the Ringel Kulka paper, they uh, found the pH was 6.8 versus 7.3, which is about a half a pH unit um, in, in the proximal large bowel, but not necessarily in the cecum. So, um, when we think about what's going on here, uh, I, I floated, floated the idea for Lebo out there, because um, why, are the, why is the pH lower? It, it almost certainly is because of excessive fermentation. And when bacteria ferment carbohydrates, and that's really what's going on in the early part of the digestive tract, fermenting carbohydrates, they produce short-chain fatty acids. Those are, those are acids. And that's why the pH goes down. And so it's hard for me to think of another explanation except the bacteria are overgrowing in the early part of the large bowel. And, and they're producing these short-chain fatty acids. So let's look at those next. And, and these are a little tough to measure um, because the current technology is to measure short-chain fatty acids in fecal samples. But a whole lot can happen between the area we're interested in, the small intestine, the early part of the large intestine, and a fecal sample. You know, they can be absorbed by the body. They can be used by other microbes. Uh, so it's not the best scenario, but it's, it's what we're stuck with at the moment. Um, I did talk to Dr. Che last night about this problem, and he says that there is a solution on the way to be able to measure short-chain fatty acids in, in the earlier in the large bowel, so that would be amazing. But let's look at some of these studies. The Tana paper that was out of Japan, uh, they found in IBS versus controls increased uh, levels of acetate, propionate, and total short-chain fatty acids, and they linked that to worsening symptoms and higher firmicutes. Uh, the second study teased apart IBSD and IBSC, and they showed similar results, increased acetate, butyrate, propionate, as well as valerate in, I, in IBSD, but then in, in IBSC, they found lower levels of, um, in this case, propionate and butyrate, which could be something like as it, when bacteria slow down in constipation, they can ferment more, sure, but also you have more time for these short chain fatty acids to be absorbed or things to happen. Um, and I just threw in this old paper with uh, uh, SIBO patients showing that they had. Uh, fourfold increase in short-chain fatty acids in small intestinal jejunal samples. In obesity patients, they found something similar. Increased acetate, propionate, butyrate, valerate, and total short-chain fatty acids, and it correlated with an increase in firmicutes over bacteroidetes. So 
a, a lot of this seems to be tying together. Of course, there's always some dissenting study. The one we just talked about, Ringel Coker, with the pH study on the previous slide, they also looked at short-chain fatty acids and didn't see a change, and they suggested it might not be a great real-time marker trying to discern short-chain fatty acids from fecal samples. Okay. So let's look at gases for a moment. One thing we know is that with IBS, there is an increase in intestinal gas, and that's been measured some different ways. Um, what I found a little surprising was I, I went looking for definitive evidence of these gases and whether they're linked to diarrhea or constipation, and it was a little bit confusing. There's the general consensus that hydrogen is linked to diarrhea, but if you guys know the exact paper that proves it, send it to me because I was a little bit surprised I didn't see something jump out at me. Methane absolutely slowed motility and uh, constipation. And hydrogen sulfide, as we already talked about, um, the, the Lynn and Pemintel presentation of DDW a couple of years ago were saying it was linked to diarrhea over 6 ppi. Uh, the paper out of um, India there, uh, Bannock, they linked it to um, diarrhea. But it's hard to figure out the levels there because they used a different system instead of P PPM. I'm sorry, did I say PPI before? PPM. Uh, so again, it's a little confusing about hydrogen sulfide. Is it really diarrhea? And, and we talked about that study where sulfite, sulfite reducing bacteria were increased in constipation. So we need more data. We, we need that test. <laughs> um, and in um, both methane and hydrogen were linked to increasing uh, BMI. So some connections there, not, not perfect. Okay. So this is the best summary I could come up with from what we looked at, that in terms of the metabolic changes, lower pH in the cecum and proximal large bowel, but no change in the small intestine. That was shown by two studies um, that agree with each other. Short-chain fatty acids higher in IBSD, potentially lower in IBSC, um, but there are also some variability. So we had one study that didn't see those, um, and also the connection with obesity. And IBS, um, you know, involves increased gas production. The hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide seem to be linked to diarrhea, but who knows? That could change. Um, and the methane is definitely linked to. Um, slow transit and constipation. Okay. So do diets fix what's going on here? And the first thing I wanted to look at is the pH. Again, I did not find studies that looked at um, this question in IBS. Um, but what I did find is kind of an opposite approach. Instead, just looked at studies that showed what happens when you add fermentable material. What happens to the pH in the intestines? And so I did find some studies. This um, first one on lactulose, uh, showing lactulose significantly acidifies the um, proximal colon. That really surprised me because that was done in 1974, and it was using smart pill technology that could measure pH. I, I never knew they had that back then. Um, and then also a study showing fiber decreases the, the, the fecal pH. The other thing I thought was interesting is I looked at some studies where they, um, they took samples, fecal samples from healthy volunteers, and they cultured them differentially at different pHs. And it was really interesting. They found that at, the, at a more acidic pH, pH 5.5, it really favored the growth of the firmicutes. And if they raised the pH up to 6.5, it favored the growth of the bacteroidetes. So that's consistent with kind of this picture that's emerging, you've got this acidified, pro acidified proximal colon, you've got an increase in things like ruminococcus and firmicutes, you've got a lower pH, which is perfect for those guys, they love it. If it if, and on an animal-based diet, it's shifting around the other way. So while I don't have proof, a low-carbohydrate diet should reverse this scenario.
Okay, so on the short chain fatty acids, I'm, I'm looking at those same two studies, Duncan and Russell, and both showed that they reduced total short chain fatty acids uh, by half in one case, 30% in the other case, and fourfold, um, was it, yeah, butyrate was fourfold reduced in one study and by 50% in the other. So um, that's the orange arrow. It's a confusing slide. Whereas in the Defilipis study, a plant-based diet was linked to an increase in um, short-chain fatty acid levels. And, you know, I'm not poo-pooing plant-based diets by any means. I'm just showing you the data. And in, in this study, and it's just one study, they did, were eating a lot of legumes and things like that. So there's probably a good bit of you know, fermentation going on there. And this is a summary on, um, on low-carb diets or low fermentable-carb diets on, on the gases. The elemental diet, this was a famous study by Pemintel's team, 2004, um, absolutely reduced hydrogen. It was interesting that if you look at the materials and methods on that paper, they measured methane too, but then they didn't report on it unless I missed it. So I really am curious about you know, seeing if we, can, if we can get some data on methane levels with diet. And so that was an opportunity there. I, maybe I'll write to Pemintel and ask him, but he probably won't remember, it's too long ago. Um, the low FODMAP diet in this study that I've referenced reduced hydrogen, but not methane. Fiber-free diet, uh, this is in that um, Hunter Lab uh, study, reduced both hydrogen and methane. However, there weren't a lot of people in the study and not everybody makes methane. So when you take that, factor all that in, it wasn't statistically very significant for the methane. So we don't really have a great answer for methane. Hydrogen's going down and, and hydrogen sulfide is honestly just an open question. And we just need the, the hydrogen sulfide breath test to figure that out. All right, and this just is a higher level summary. Lower carb diets, lower the Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes ratio, they reduce short chain fatty acid levels and presumably raise the pH of the proximal colon. And they reduce hydrogen gases, um, they reduce intestinal gases, hydrogen, and possibly hydrogen, uh, meth um, I'm sorry, uh, methane, but may increase hydrogen sulfide. And the only reason I'm saying that is because <clears throat> adding fermentable carbohydrates like lactulose or, um, or fiber, um, Oh, no, it was resistant starch and lactulose, I think, was used in a couple of studies. It showed that hydrogen sulfide-producing bacteria um, would go down. So I'm thinking a low-carb diet it could, go, could be the opposite, and it could go up. question is how much, and is it, it doesn't matter. All right. I want to um, change course here. And, and this slide, you know, if you don't know by now, shows my, my bias. Um, I was really helped with low carbohydrate diets. And uh, this Andre Zenfeld, I've met him, he's a great guy, dietdoctor.com. But he lists a lot of randomly controlled trials with the links, and so you can get the, the studies there, comparing low carb to high carb diets. And they, they point to some very beneficial results with uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cardiovascular, stroke, weight loss. Um, So it's, there, there are positive attributes of a low carbohydrate diet. We're going to get to the possible negative side, but I think that's a good one. Another one, if you're interested in cardiovascular health, um, if, you, if you're not following the lectures of Ivor Cummins, uh, he's phenomenal. He's an engineer that had his blood markers were all messed up and he was gaining a bunch of weight. And he decided to take an engineering approach to figure out what are the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And uh, he's got tons of free content and lectures out there. And he's just co-authored a book with Jeffrey Gerber, Eat Rich and Live Long, if you want to pull it all together that way. Um, but he sums it up as the elephant in the room is for cardiovascular disease is insulin resistant, resistance and a lower carb diet is the solution. So, um, if these diets are good, lower carb diets are good for us, you know, how about our microbiota? 
And so, I, kn I mean, I know there's a larger debate about the health of plant-based and low-carb diets and animal-based diets. I understand that. But in terms of digestive health, we're, we're a little pinned in here, I think, as somebody with just a bad case of reflux, and I need to be on a low-carbohydrate diet, and I know a lot of people like me. Um, I tried to go on one of those low-carb cruises and talk to people about this. They didn't need my talk. They were all fine. So um, I think there's something to it. But let's get to the other side. And I just want to put it all out on the table. What are the criticisms? What are the problems? And at least start to try to work, work our way through them. Uh, a lot of this thing with fiber started from um, Dennis Burkett. He spent some time in Africa, and he um, noticed there was, seemed to be a lot of healthy people there eating fiber, and he came up with this hypothesis that maybe low fiber diets would lead this colon cancer. And so there's a lot, you know, it's been built on that, and then you've got the um, uh, Sonnenbergs out um, in um, California. They're working with mice, and, and they're making the case that we're starving our microbiota. And so that's the question. Are we starving on microbiota? Before we get to that, though, let's, let's take something off the table to make the argument as simple as possible. I call these the no-brainers, right? Fructose, lactose, and sugar alcohols. It's well documented that people have intolerances to these, and avoiding them is really powerful. It's a powerful solution. Years and years of data. Um, nobody seems to be mind taking them away, so I'm not going to spend time worrying about those. However, these two are more controversial, resistant starch and fiber. They're not digested, and they are fermentable. Um, resistant starch is very fermentable, and these ruminococcus, those formicides, they love it. I mean, they love it. a bunch of studies just on that. Um, and fiber, most species of fiber are quite fermentable. Lignin's not fermentable. Cellulose is not always fermentable. Depends who you are and which bacteria you have. But a lot of people can, can digest it. Some of these other ones, stachyose, raffinose, fructose oligosaccharide, highly fermentable and make a whole ton of gas. So putting this, this argument about whether this is healthy or not, cutting out resistant starch and fiber, um, let's look at some support for doing it for IBS. Uh, the NICE guidelines, um, National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence in the UK, they use Cochrane reviews and all that stuff. They'll tell you, just, oh, you just go to the link, and there it is for IBS, lactose, fructose, resistant starch, fiber, and sugar alcohols. Look at the textbook of primary and acute care medicine, the chapter on intestinal gases. If you don't want a lot of intestinal gas, you've got to watch out for Lactose, fructose, resistant starch, fiber, and sugar alcohols. Uh, just a couple of links here with um, how much uh, ruminococcus loves resistant starch. So it seems to make sense to do this for these functional GI issues where we have a lot of fermentation and a lot of gas. But we, we want to get to that question of uh, are we starving our microbiota? So these are some of the questions I rounded up with the concerns people have. And I just want to get them out here, and we can really haggle it out. Starving the mic uh, microbes is the big one. Are we starving our microbiota? Also, are we reducing short-chain fatty acids, fermentation products, to the point where we're depriving our colonocytes that feed on things like butyrate? That's another big one. And uh, Burkitt. Are uh, we increasing our risk of colon cancer? Are uh, we going to be end up constipated? And could it lead to this um, mucosal atrophy? <coughs> Notice that's spelled wrong. Uh, and also, could it promote um, bile-tolerant um, bacteria like uh, yeah, Bilophila wadsworthia? But there's also E. coli species that can do this. There's some Bacteroidetes that can do it. And it's interesting that these challenges are not just coming from out there, out, outside of the low-carb community. David Perlmutter, he was a keto guy, a low-carb keto guy. I just listened to one of his podcasts about why you desperately need carbs. Um, William Davis of Wheat Belly is questioning you know, the safety of ketogenic diets. So it's coming from everywhere, and so we just need to you know, deal with it.
Um, but I will make a quick note. Most of the studies that gave rise to these concerns are uh, observational studies or done in mice. There's not a whole ton of human studies on this. All right. The first one I want to deal with is that why it's hard to starve the gut microbiota. I'm not saying you can't do it. If you, if you take a sick child and put them on an IV elemental diet for three months, some, some issues can come up. But we've co-evolved with this population of microbes in our gut. And the main purpose, the main reason they're there is to prevent us from starving to death. So why would a mechanism that's, that evolved for that purpose, why would it not be fairly robust in the face of a challenge where we were deprived for calories. Um, also, bacteria can feed on these uh, uh, mucus and mucins that the body makes uh, throughout our entire digestive tract. Uh, it's 80% carbohydrate. It's got all kinds of glycans in there, and it's got nitrogen and sulfur. Feeds our bacteria when we can't, and it's regulated. Bacteria like that Verruco microbia, Acamensa mucinophila, live on this mucosal surface and they're able to break, to unlock, because it's a lock and key kind of thing, unlock the sugars in these mucus molecules and cross feed a lot of the other bacteria. So, um, and there's uh, many other bacteria that are mucus feeders as well that can do this kind of trick. So I at least had the thought that it may be a regulated feeding of our microbiota. Uh, you'll see that link down the bottom is actually um, the fiber that feeds a cheater's gut microbes, animal fiber. Um, so I wonder if it's a regulated feeding of our gut microbiota, something like you might see with gluconeogenesis, the liver making glucose when we're on a low carbohydrate diet. Um, also, proteins and fats feed our microbiota. Uh, proteins, yeah, we've known for years and years and years that many amino acids are fermentable by bacteria, and so they have that protein source. But fats, I just learned this myself. Um, until last year, I was always telling people, don't even worry about fats, bacteria can't use fats because you need beta oxidation and that requires oxygen and the gut's anaerobic. That's what I said. Well, <laughs> a team of really smart microbiologists proved me wrong. They took some samples, got these things growing in culture, this continuous culture, and they literally uh, meticulously showed that they could in fact get energy from fats and they did it by coupling uh, beta oxidation with um, uh, anaerobic, um, anaerobic oxidation, beta oxidation with anaerobic fermentation. And it's not a high energy deal. They grow slowly, but they can do it. Okay, and then also the fermentable material beyond fiber, animal fiber, just lactose and oligosaccharides and dairy, things from collagen and chondroitin, all of the things that a cheater's microbiome might uh, feast on. And then one more piece to this. And, and to explain this one, I, I'm going to tell you about this calculation that I created that's the basis of the Fast Track Diet and the Fast Track Diet books and app. It's called the uh, Fermentation Potential Calculation. And it's really just a rearrangement of the glycemic index equation and modified. So instead of measuring how quickly carbohydrates go into the bloodstream relative to glucose, it measures the reverse, how many carbohydrates persist in the intestine, potentially fermentable, right, FP. And all you need is a glycemic index and, and the nutritional facts. And there's a link there for a free calculator if you want to try it. But for these purposes, for this purpose, I did just a quick um, summary of what somebody might eat in a day on the Western diet. And it wasn't extravagant. There were no Cokes in there. Cokes are at another 14 grams or whatever we cook, Coke you have. But just uh, coffee, milk, sugar, blueberry muffin, orange juice in the morning, ham and cheese sandwich, small bag of chips, one oatmeal cookie, uh, the yogurt with the fruit, a little thing of yogurt with the fruit, spaghetti and meatballs, tomato sauce, two slices of sourdough bread, small glass of milk, just a cup, and then a s one slice of chocolate cake. When you look at the fiber from that food, it comes to 14 grams, which I didn't try to do that, it just came out that way, and that's pretty much typically what they say Americans consume fiber for a day, and that we should consume 24 or 26, or if you're a man, 34 or 36, 14. But when you look at this other fermentable material, it, it includes fiber, by the way. 
So if you subtract the 14 grams from the 150, you, you have 136 grams of new fermentable material that you didn't know about before. Furthermore, if you calculate how much gas can be produced from these carbs, and here's how you do it, 30 grams of carbohydrates, uh, if they're unabsorbed and they're fermented, they'll allow bacteria to produce 10 liters of gas. So for 150 grams, you get 50 liters of gas. So all I'm saying is, and, and you don't even need this complicated formula. If you just consider the average glycemic index of a vegetable is 55. So 45% of the vegetable's carbohydrates are going to be absorbed more slowly than glucose. That's kind of the, the simple way of stating it. So I do think there's a lot of uh, fermentable material there. All right, let's move on and talk about the impact of low short-chain fatty acids. Can you give us a reason about the range of what the FC would be? Put for somebody to be on during the... And what's the reasonable range? Yeah. Of yeah. Well, so this example we saw, that person was on 150, <laughs> right? Um, but a more, much more reasonable target would be 20 to 40, depending on the situation, to get the symptoms under control. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It is. Yeah, that's the point. It's huge. Um, all right, so short chain fatty acids, same two studies, right? We know they're uh, significantly reduced. But is it a problem or not? They're, they're measured in stool samples. That, that's extra short chain fatty acids after it leaves our body. So we're still producing more short chain fatty acids than our body needs. Also, these. Um, uh, the Russell study showed increased branched-chain fatty acids, and um, there was another study that showed that on the animal-based diet that th they had more short-chain fatty acids in total than on a plant-based diet. So it's just these branched-chain, th they're different, and a lot of times they don't measure them. Colonocytes can use the branched-chain fatty acids as well, and they can use the ketones. And the last uh, one, I'm not going to talk about that in the interest of time, but Alberto Martin at the University of Toronto, published in Cell five years ago, he did a really remarkable study where he, um, and it was in mice, and it was a mouse tumor model, um, the same genotype of these tumors as in one-fifth of human colon cancers. And he found that too much um, butyrate may be a carcinogen, and, and he could stop it by putting people on antibiotics or low-carb diet, so, but I'm not gonna dwell on that. All right. Um, Let's get to this one. All right. Does, low, does a low fiber diet cause colon cancer? Or is it a risk factor for colon cancer? Well, not according to these studies. So just the Fuchs study and the male health professional study, between those two, that was almost 150,000 people in those studies. They found no association between fiber and colon cancer. The Fukuoka study, um, they looked at 850 people that actually had colon cancer and the same number of controls, and they didn't find any association. And there's this whole um, study on fiber showing that people with idiopathic constipation that were given uh, th an option to be a no fiber, medium fiber, or high fiber, the ones on high fiber went to the bathroom every six and a half days, the one on medium fiber went three and a half days, and the ones on no fiber went every day. So it's one study, you know, could do some more work, but it, I think it at least points that fiber <laughs> does not look like a great uh, solution for constipation, and the other study mentions um, uh, is on diverticulosis. All right, mucosal atrophy. This one's, um, you know, kind of important because if if you if you have mucosal atrophy, you're right. You can have bacteria can get across there. You can have leaky gut. You can have translocation. It can be if somebody's in the hospital, it can lead to sepsis. And the, the worry came from mice studies, fiber deficient mice, or people on an elemental diet, mice on an elemental diet would suffer from this mucosal atrophy. But the same kind of study, also IV elemental diet study in humans found no translocation compared to the control group. So they, they didn't see in humans what was happening in mice. And, and the same com, uh, conclusions were reached on a broader review. But I had brought up earlier, right, children on an IV elemental diet for three months, they did start to see some of that. So just to put it within range, it's not 
it's, it's not you know, that you can never cause this, but you wouldn't generally put kids on a, a diet like that for long. Um, okay, so even in the most carb-limiting situation, um, they didn't see that atrophy. All right. And the last one, um, we'll see if we have time for this or not. Uh, but just clicking through it real quick. It's the one on Bilafelar and, and Desulfovibrio and some of these um, sulfate-reducing bacteria. Uh, so on an animal-based diet, they find like a spike in these organisms. And they were worried about it because it's linked to, um, they've, they've picked this up in complicated appendicitis, and it's more prevalent in adenoma patients and so forth, and, and it's linked to colitis in mice. Okay. But First of all, the populations of these bacteria normally are very low. Um, and the mouse studies, they're a little bit iffy. They were, in one study, they were force feeding these, them these Bilofila instead of it just growing naturally. Um, <coughs> the study on colitis, they couldn't show that in wild type mice. It had to be a double knockout IL-10 mouse. And that's an uh, anti-inflammatory cytokine and more susceptible without it to inflammatory reactions. Um, you don't see this kind of thing on a balanced low-carb diet, at least I've seen no evidence of this so far. No evidence that ketogenic diets are linked to a higher incidence of appendicitis. And with appendicitis, you don't find just the bilophilia, you find other bacteria there too. Um, yeah, dietary fiber and consumption is bad. Now that's a little bit indirect. And there's other things that will actually decrease bilophilia. All right. And then there's all these amazing um, benefits of hydrogen sulfide. So I'm not gonna go through that, but it's quite amazing. And there are many mechanisms in place to protect us from um, making toxic levels of this stuff. So there's a lot of positive biology too about hydrogen sulfide. All right, so here's the conclusions. Low carb or low fermentable carb diets, they improve the symptoms, but they also seem to impact the disease processes, what's underlying these symptoms. Not the absolute root cause, but part of the disease process and promote what you might consider a more lean um, microbiota profile. And some of the things that we've seen go wrong and the low carb diet seem to um, improve it with the, with the open question about hydrogen sulfide. And the other thing I, I would just add is from my readings, I, I, I do feel like, you know, fiber might, uh, that fiber deficiency is detrimental to us and our microbiota. I feel that concern is overblown personally. All right, we'll stop there. Thank you.